Anyone working at the SCP Foundation will no doubt be familiar with SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. For those of you that aren't, it essentially does what it says on the can. Or rather, it's assembled just like it is in the flat pack furniture instructions. While on the outside it appears to be an average, unassuming branch of the affordable Swedish furniture outlet, inside is a different story. Crossing the boundary of SCP-3008's automatic doors and venturing a little too deep into its maze-like confines leads to an endless labyrinth of Kullens and Hurdals, a dimensionally transcendental area that defies our ordinary human understanding of physical space. Lurking deep within the aisles of the infinite Ikea are SCP-3008-2s that are known as the Staff a race of misshapen, faceless humanoids with long, freakish arms that prey on anyone that enters once night falls. And yes, there are people inside SCP-3008, trapped souls that have wandered into the wrong IKEA, only to end up missing, sometimes spending months or even years inside, if they ever get out at all. An alert was ringing, filling the air with loud, blaring noise. Every member of Foundation personnel stationed outside the infinite IKEA was rushing about, guards standing at the ready. The storefront of SCP-3008 had been silent for quite a long while, with nothing reported going in or coming out. But the Foundation knew far better than to assume that SCP-3008 didn't have surprises in store for them. Pun fully intended. Hey, don't you dare click off, we know where you live and Red Right Hand are lining up the shot. <clears throat> Anyway, there appeared to be some kind of commotion beyond the doors that quickly slid open just in time for something to be slung through the front entrance. It almost looked as if the IKEA itself had spat something out, like it was so toxic it couldn't endure having to keep it within its confines any longer. Cautiously approaching with their weapons raised, the Foundation's on-site security team moved towards the discarded mess to get a better look at whatever it was. It turned out to be a person, a man in around his late fifties, beaten within an inch of his life. He was wearing some kind of rudimentary circlet or crown around his head, seemingly fashioned by hand out of stationery and other material scavenged from the paper shop department of the infinite IKEA. Speaking of, the man was wearing an IKEA manager's uniform, with a name tag pinned to his chest that identified him as Chris. Hanging from his neck was an IKEA-branded notepad with a message scrawled on it. But before you find out what that message was, we have another important message for you. One that directly impacts you. Yes, I'm talking directly to you. It comes from the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. We know you've heard a lot of big claims from a lot of different VPN providers, but you absolutely must hear why we've chosen PIA as our personal VPN and why you should do the same. Unlike the SCP Foundation and some of those other VPN services out there, PIA is the world's most transparent VPN provider. They never record or store any user data at all. Don't believe us? Their no-log policy has been proven multiple times in court and was even verified by an independent audit by Deloitte. And they stay transparent so that you don't have to. With PIA's VPN, your IP address is hidden and your connection is encrypted, keeping your digital life protected from the prying eyes of network admins or even a certain mobile task force unit. And they've just launched what is maybe their coolest feature yet. With servers now in all 50 US states, you can look like you're surfing the web from exactly where you want. Need to look like you're checking out that SCP database entry from Indiana? They've got an IP address for you there. Or maybe you're on the West Coast and want to catch the early East Coast premiere of your favorite show and avoid spoilers. Not a problem with private internet access. I could go on and on about all the features I regularly use, but why not try it yourself by going to www.piavpn.com forward slash SCP and get an 82% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.11 a month. Plus, get three extra months completely for free. Not long before Chris was found in his roughed up state outside the only IKEA that goes on forever, he was working at a different branch, one that was much smaller on the inside. Chris was the manager of the store and widely regarded by his employees to be an awful person. Nobody knew if he had always been that way or if instilling him in a position of power over other retail workers had somehow caused him to develop a bit of a god complex. Either way, there was little he ever did to invoke much camaraderie with his colleagues. 
Whenever any of the store's workers were on their breaks, which they usually had to remind Chris were permitted by law and not optional, conversation often turned to their collective poor opinions of their manager. He'd been given the job out of pretty blatant nepotism. It was well known how cozy Chris was with the regional manager of all the IKEA stores in the area. On top of that, Chris had a pretty nasty habit of trying to force his employees to stay behind after their scheduled shifts had finished, while also refusing to pay them for overtime. You see, it was his own mismanagement of the work rota that had left the store understaffed at crucial moments of the day. The solution, you would think, should be obvious. Hiring a few more new staff to help with the workload and to start their shifts at times when others were about to clock out for the day. Ah, uh, but new employees wouldn't work for free. Their wages would come out of the store's budget. And why would Chris want to take on new workers? As the person in charge of payroll, he could help himself to that money, adding the wages of prospective colleagues as a bonus, on top of his own unjustifiably exorbitant salary. Perhaps the worst part about having Chris as a manager was that he seemed to get away with murder. As long as the store kept making a profit, then the management above him didn't care how badly he treated his employees or flouted the rules for his own gain. But it was those same colleagues who had suffered and been scorned by Chris's behavior who had finally had enough. Retail work is hard. Having to deal with rude and impolite customers on a day-to-day -day basis, working long hours of uninteresting and repetitive labor, all for a paycheck that only just covered rent. Like we said, it is a hard line of work, and the people in it deserve the utmost respect. But you throw megalomaniacal manager into the mix, and you've got a ticking time bomb on your hands. One that'll sooner or later explode. It was witnessing Chris blatantly framing a younger member of staff that finally triggered detonation. The kid had only been a student, working at IKEA all through his weekends to make enough money to pay his bills. Chris saw this less experienced employee not as a human being doing his best, but a chance to make a quick buck by breaking the rules. The manager started stealing cash from the register, then blamed it on his young staff member when the losses started to show on the store's monthly financial reports. Seeing that for themselves, the other members of the staff knew that it was the manager's responsibility to empty the registers regularly, so they didn't have too much cash in them in case of a robbery. Given how much they all despised Chris, it didn't take much effort for the entire workforce to organize a walkout halfway through the working day. Outraged, Chris had tried calling any colleagues that were off shift, barking at them to come in and work on their days off. All of them said no. The thing is, when you work in retail, complaints to upper management never seem to go anywhere. Like we said, if the store's making profit, that's all they care about. But seeing such drastic action from the staff of the store he was supposed to be running, the IKEA higher-ups came down on Chris like a hammer. They instructed that he be sent to another IKEA outlet for a whole afternoon to receive some mandatory interpersonal training. Little did anyone realize that this was the last anyone would ever see of him. Not that his old staff was sad to hear that he had disappeared. Arriving at what looked like an ordinary IKEA, Chris parked his car outside. The place seemed deserted, no customers filing in and out of the front doors, the only other vehicles in the parking lot looking like they had just been abandoned by their owners. The manager scoffed to himself. These people running this store were going to teach him how to do his job? Indignantly, he clipped his name tag on and stepped out of his car, marching across the asphalt towards the entrance. The automatic doors gently slid open, shutting smoothly behind Chris as he stepped inside. The whole store was quiet, barely a peep from anywhere. The high ceiling of the IKEA store he so poorly managed carried a lot of noise and made any sound echo throughout the building. The squeaking of shoes against the vinyl floors, the bustle of customers, the electronic beep of cash registers, and the lull, dulled music played over the intercom. But there was none of that here. A deathly silence filled the aisles of flat pack furniture, display models of hemnesses and tricils standing as still and foreboding as gravestones. Suddenly, the sound of movement reverberated from between one row of aisles. Chris began marching towards its source, expecting to find an employee who would point him in the direction of the office where his training was supposed to be conducted. Sure enough, within a few steps, 
Chris spotted a figure in a familiar bright yellow t-shirt and blue pants, the same uniform his IKEA underlings wore at his store. Excuse me, he called as he strode towards the employee, shoes clomping against the floor with every step. You need to tell me where your manager is. I'm from the store across town, here for some pointless training seminar. Chris hadn't waited until he was close enough to engage in pleasant conversation, instead making his demands as he approached. The figure in the IKEA uniform, however, didn't turn to face him. Hey, I'm talking to you, Chris shouted. You deaf or something? There was a pause, telling Chris that what happened next wasn't in response to what he said, although that didn't make it any less frightening. The figure, who had been hunched over near the floor, suddenly drew itself up to its full height. It towered over Chris. It must have measured close to seven whole feet. As it turned, the malignant manager saw its face, or that it didn't have one. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but a smooth surface without any discernible features. Its arms were elongated, huge claw-like hands hanging down to the creature's knees. Being a coward, Chris turned and ran immediately. Confrontation was another area his employees had noticed he was sorely lacking in. Whenever faced with a rude and cantankerous customer, Chris would never defend his colleagues or their actions. Instead, he would suck up and brown nose to customers who were clearly in the wrong, essentially rolling over the minute anyone raised their voice. So now, confronted with a lumbering, faceless entity, his self-preservation instincts were kicked into overdrive, and he raced deeper into the store. Not exactly in the best shape, he slowed to a halt, wheezing as he tried to catch his breath. That was when, looking around, Chris noticed just how long the aisle seemed. He was sure he would still be able to see the front door from here, yet couldn't spot the entrance anywhere from where he was currently standing, panting like a thirsty dog. He looked over his shoulder. There was no sign of the staff member he'd encountered. Little did Chris know that it had lumbered off in the opposite direction the second he had run away from it, hardly paying him any mind, at least while the lights were still on. Unable to find the entrance or even a fire door he couldn't escape through, it didn't take long for the lights inside the infinite Ikea to dim, marking the start of the night cycle. Something about it being darker made the sounds of shuffling even more noticeable. There were more than one of those faceless, uniformed creatures. Trembling, Chris climbed inside a klepstad, a wardrobe with a sliding door. Barely able to sleep with his knees tucked up under his chin, he spent the entire night inside the cramped, confined space. Every sound of movement from outside brought with it the mental image of one of the staff sliding open the outer door and reaching down to grab him. The whole sleepless while, Chris couldn't help but think about what he could have possibly done to deserve this cruel fate. The next morning, the lights came back on and started to bleed through the seams of the flat pack wardrobe, waking Chris from what little restless sleep he had gotten. He paused, unsure if he should venture out in case he came across another one of the staff. Suddenly, he heard the sound of voices, muted and muffled by the door of the Klepstad, but definitely real human voices. Had it all been some horrible nightmare? Had he fallen asleep at work and been stuffed into a wardrobe by his ungrateful employees? Oh, now he had them. He would sue every last one of them out of their jobs. Sliding the door open and tumbling out of the Klepstad, Chris found himself flying face down on the store floor, his legs too cramped to move. Just as he tried to will them into moving again, a voice called out to him. Hey, mister, it said. You okay there? A trio of footsteps raced over to where he was. And before he could get a good look at who they belonged to, hands were pulling Chris up off the floor. He looked at his rescuers, bemused to see other people in this endless void of affordable homeware. They were two men and a woman, each in disheveled clothing that looked like they had been wearing the same thing for years. Easy there, fella, one of the men spoke. Name's Buster. Which settlement are you from? Why, what do you mean by settlement? Chris asked, confused. Looks like we got another newbie, the woman chuckled dryly. When'd you get here? Ah, uh, yesterday, I think, the former manager answered. Time can be a bit screwy in here, the second man chimed in. I'm Nolan. This here is Janine. You got a name? Uh, Chris, he nodded. You hungry, Chris? The three survivors led Chris through the winding expanse of the Ikea without an end, navigating the identical aisles with the expertise of people that had been here long enough to know their way around. In what felt like the tiniest fraction of the time that he had been lost the day before, they brought Chris to the food court. It was bustling with activity, more so than the one at his store, 
with people patiently lining up to take their fill of food from the IKEA menu. After joining the queue, Buster returned and handed Chris a plate of Swedish meatballs with mashed potato, peas, cream sauce, and lingonberry jam. So pleased to see food again, Chris began to gluttonously devour the whole plate while the others explained some of what was going on here, although he was barely listening. According to Janine, who had been there the longest, the inside of this Ikea was like an endless maze. There was no clear way out, even when retracing steps back the way one first entered. Nolan then weighed in and explained that there were pockets of people who had survived this long inside SCP-3008 by forming their own little communities. Thanks to the sheer amount of space within the store, these settlements were almost the size of small townships, built using whatever furniture, appliances, and other materials the other survivors had been able to scrounge up. How come you don't run out of food? Chris interjected. It replenishes every day, man, Buster replied, gesturing to the food court around them. Sure, it's not ideal if you aren't a huge fan of IKEA food, but you get used to it. Could be worse, all things considered. Then what the hell do you all do for money? The stubborn manager demanded. Look around you, Janine scoffed. We don't need it in here, we're cut off from the rest of the world. Stuff like money hardly makes a difference. Can't get us home or keep us fed, so what's the point? Chris sighed. Evidently frustrated at the prospect of living inside an Ikea, yet not having the opportunity for monetary gain. So, who's in charge? He asked. Who runs this place? Well, no one. Nolan shrugged. Settlements all work together, help each other out if needed, but we don't have any singular person running things. Hearing that out loud caused a twisted idea to form in Chris's balding head. Asking to be escorted by Buster to the right aisle, he started gathering up what he needed to make a rudimentary crown. What's that for? Buster asked, a little concerned about what Chris was planning. Oh, you wouldn't understand, he replied, not looking up from applying hot glue. Don't worry, I'll explain it in nice, simple terms when I'm ready. That night, despite being welcomed into the trio's town of Lighting with open arms, Chris slipped back to the food court while the other settlers were sleeping. Carefully, he avoided the lurking staff and their drone calls of, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Reaching his destination, the malicious manager lay in wait for the next morning, hiding out underneath the counter where the food was served. The next morning, the collected survivors of the infinite Ikea were met with an unfamiliar sight as they approached the food court. All the food had gone. It had still replenished overnight like it usually did, but someone had gathered it up before anyone had a chance to eat. Stood atop the counter with a smug look on his face, Chris made a show of placing his crown over his head. Morning, everyone, he announced. From today, things are going to be a little different around here, but I'm sure we'll be able to work together like one big happy family. Holding the gathered SCP-3008 residents as his literal captive audience, all of them hungry and irritable, Chris outlined what he had determined to be the best system possible for how things should be run inside the Endless Store. I will keep all the food secure and safe, and we're going to start rationing it out, he explained. What for? A voice shouted from the crowd. It reappears every night anyway. Well, here's what we're going to do. If you just shut up and let me finish, Chris replied calmly, but with a condescending tone of superiority. According to Chris's grand scheme, every day each settlement would be allocated what he deemed to be an acceptable amount of rationed food to feed its population of survivors. Then he made an offer to anyone who was willing to help him. If someone provided their services in collecting the food each morning and distributing the rationed amount, then Chris would allow them to take an extra portion of rations just for themselves. You see now? He asked the crowd, oblivious to how many of them were scowling at him. Anyone that wants to help, they get rewarded with a little bit extra. Call it a bonus. What if we don't want to help you? Another onlooker called. Well, that's fine by me, Chris sneered back. More for those who want it. I think what they mean is, Janine shouted from the group, what if we don't want you to implement this ridiculous system at all? What's to stop us from just taking the food we need every morning like we did before you showed up? Typical, he tutted. How lazy. You just want the privilege of having more. Then you should work to earn it. And as for your silly little notion of just taking, I'm going to be here every morning. I'll get to decide who eats and who doesn't and how much they deserve. And if anyone wants to take more than they deserve without offering their help in return, then they'll get half of the rations they would get. And so will their settlement. So, with those queries out of the way, allow me to introduce myself as your new store manager. 
When they recovered Chris's body outside of the entrance to SCP-3008, the Foundation had no way of knowing exactly who had beaten him up so badly. The other survivors inside the infinite Ikea might have done it themselves, while overthrowing his short-lived stint as manager. Or they might have decided not to lower themselves to that level, and instead shunned him from entering their settlements, leaving him to fend for himself. With the staff around every corner and their history of turning aggressive towards humans come nightfall, Chris's chances of survival were slim. The only real clue was the note that had been found with him which read, You can have him back. We don't want him. Now if you aren't quite ready to check out of the infinite Ikea, then you should go and check out Life in the Endless Ikea for another tale of a trapped soul in SCP-3008. And then, if you ever want suggestions on what to do if you find yourself in the same predicament, then how to actually beat SCP-3008 The Infinite Ikea is the only survival guide you'll ever need.